Welcome, everybody. It is so good to see so many familiar faces and to see um, some new faces that I, I maybe don't know. My name is Christina Soriano, and I have the uh, privilege of serving as the Vice Provost of the Arts and Interdisciplinary Initiatives here at Wake. I also am um, a faculty member in the Theater and Dance Department. Um, today, though, I want to share that I am here um, as a fan and friend of Amar Basha's. And so I, I thank you for joining me in celebrating his year at Wake Forest. Um, so Wake uh, Forest has our inaugural um, Artist Protection Fund Fellow this year that we have had with Amar Basha. And um, the Artist Protection Fund is uh, an organization that's a part of the Institute for International Education. And I learned about this program when I was a reviewer for the National Fulbright um, program. And I remember hearing about the APF mission, which I'll read in a moment. And I remember thinking, um, come on in. Yep, you're in the right spot. I remember thinking, um, what could be more pro humanitate in embodying the idea of our mission at this institution than working with um, this distinguished institution in the mission of serving artists in places <coughs> where they are unsafe to do their work. So the Artist Protection Fund is an initiative of the Institute of International Education, sponsored by the Mellon Foundation. And the APF makes fellowship grants to threaten artists from any field of practice and places them at host institutions in safe countries where they can continue their work and plan for their futures. Uh, I am a first generation Greek American woman, and I remember thinking, about um, my godfather a lot as I was reading this. He was an attorney who helped bring um, people into this country um, in his work professionally. Come on in, JD. And I, and I wanted very much to um, be a part of that legacy also as an artist and as an educator. And so when I learned about this, inst this institution, I shared this idea first with um, then Provost Kirsch and Vice Provost Klein Harrison and was so um, <coughs> excited to get their enthusiasm. And once that green light um, to, to go forward and, and uh, apply to be a part of this um, organization, um, there was a, what I called a collaborative army that followed. And that include, included colleagues from our global programs, particularly Keela Hubbard, um, I also um, can, would be remiss if I didn't thank ECAR, Every Campus a Refuge, and the student organization SAFAR. Alessandra, you especially have been such a, a colleague and partner in the work. It takes so much work to bring someone into this country who's not from this country and to have them be in our midst for a year. Um, so I thank, I thank Global Programs and Alessandra and ECAR so much. And then the international, um, not the international, though we feel international, the um, the Interdisciplinary Arts Center, my colleagues on that advisory board, so many of you are here. I see you. Thank you. Um, you immediately got behind this idea and agreed to be what we called the welcome wagon for our fellow, for Amar. And then, of course, the documentary film program. Um, and Brad Jones, as dean in that uh, graduate school, you were so welcoming and warm to say, yes, we want to meet an international Yemeni filmmaker, and yes, we want him to be a part of our faculty. So. Um, I thank all of you. I thank colleagues in music, religious studies, theater, dance, women and gender studies, and so many other places that were a part of this welcoming community. But most of all, I want to thank Amar Basha. Thank you so much. You've come to Wake and worked with students in doc film, women and gender studies, religious studies, theater, music, communications. You've served as a juror with River Run. You've attended numerous performances in Scales Fine Art, Centers, Art Center and art openings. You've attended football games and soccer games. <laughs> You've attended Wake presidential inaugurations yes. and marched in regalia. Yes. You've come to West End fire pits, satyrs, porch parties. You've met with students, particularly those who are developing their voice in advocacy. You've impressed film colleagues down the road at UNCSA and at Guilford College. Wake Forest has become richer because of your presence oh, here. Thank you. You've been a true embodiment of pro humanitate. You've been a dear friend, wow. a fan, a wise counsel, a patient observer, a studious translator, and a contemplative writer. Today, Amar will share some thoughts about his experiences at Wake over the year. 
He'll screen a, sh a few short documentary films, just making sure we're on the same page. <laughs> um, a few short documentary films, and um, you'll, you also are in for a treat. You're going to see a live scene presented that is an excerpt from the screenplay that he has been working on all year. This is based on a novel called The Handsome Jew, which he has translated into Arabic and English. We're not doing the Arabic today, just the English. Yes. Um, we are trans you will see a scene, and you're going to see two remarkable first-year students, Emma Pevery and Joe Bruno. Yeah, Emma and Joe! Yeah! yeah. <laughs> and Veer, you'll be happy to know I'm also announcing they are both in the AAP show, The Accidental Death of an Anarchist. November 10th to 12th. Yes. <laughs> In the Ring Theater, so you can see more of their incredible acting and, um, and Emma's directing of this scene if you want to come. Also, please, you noticed on the way in, there's a reception. Please join us after. We promise to end at 6.30 so that we can get to the next part. Amar, I hand it to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, well, I didn't expect this much people to come over, so I'm feeling a bit terrified now. Um, so, uh, as my dearest friend Christina talked, uh, we have pretty uh, jammed program for this event. So I will do my best to fly through the events that happened in the past 20 years with me. And if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask later on. Uh, so to start this, um, I normally like to... Uh, Serge, please come in, please, please. Thank you, thank you. Kayla, everybody. Uh, <laughs> come on. Just Mr. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I like to um, find inspirations normally uh, to help me uh, enrich my talks uh, whenever I, I have such a uh, group uh, gathering like this. So uh, I was looking at different stuff, reading different quotes by different famous people. And um, I got this quote, which I somehow, uh, I wasn't going to add it into this presentation, but it felt kind of very close to what I'm doing and throwing. So I thought to throw a quiz at you um, and see if you know who said it. If to please the people, we offer what we ourselves disapprove, how can we afterwards defend our work? Let us raise a standard to which, to which the wise and honest can repair. This event is in the hands of God. My friends who have been knowing about this, please don't talk. <laughs> Any idea who said these words? No? Well, it's written on the first page of your constitution. It's George Washington. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, without any further delays, um, I found that it wasn't really hard for me to decide where I'm going to start from. And I decided to start from um, where I really started to care, when things uh, started to make a meaning to me. And that was in England back in 2013. Now, trust me, I wasn't a gangster at that time. <laughs> uh, they used to call me the computer guy, you know, uh, the graphic designer, the web designer. In 2003, these things, if you know how to install a software or connect to the internet, it, it used to be considered like a rocket science. <laughs> so it paid well, and it, uh, it did me really good. But the reason I brought uh, England to this, because as a student, when I arrived there first time in 2000, um, there is something that might of you call the culture shock. And this culture shock, um, it, it's true, it's real, it happened. And if it happened, it didn't happen because um, we are dumb or stupid or we don't know how to adapt to new things, but it happens because we were lied to. We were lied to a lot about the West and about what's happening in the West, to a point that I was thinking at that time that maybe I should bring my religious teacher class to uh, somewhere in England and let, me, and let me just ask him if he can see Satan in the street pouring alcohol to men and women and asking them to uh, romance uh, in front of everybody. But that definitely was not the, the thing. So yes, um, this feeling of being lied to kind of really hit me very hard. Because there is lots of hate when you are lied to. If, I, if, if people um, lie to each other, it becomes very easy to hate each other. So the idea of like um, 
this, this thing kept like um, circling in my mind, and I wanted to um, kind because I was also into the graphic world, graphic designs, and to animations. My mind was uh, lit with all these ideas that I wanted to do with animation, and mostly it was all about religious jokes, political jokes, and mainly, um, especially during the, the, that time, I wanted to destroy the wall the, that was built in Israel for one reason, because walls is um, a sign of fear, and fear generates hate. And the region where I, come, I came from, it's full of hate. And all what you need is just to spark a, a, a match and everything can turn into hell. So the idea of me um, uh, developing my skills and becoming an animation filmmaker forced me to look for a, an animation course and that's where I found it in India. Uh, I had to move to India from England, but before that I went to Yemen for like a small period of time. I don't want to go into details of how is the political arena in Yemen was because I really don't have time to explain all of that. But you could say we had a little bit of democracy. It was a mess of a democracy, but there was a space. We had uh, uh, different parties, political parties. Uh, we had human rights, uh, uh, NGOs, civil rights movements. And there was a space where everybody, everybody was able at least to advocate for something, advocate for violence against women, advocate for gender, advocate for forced disappearance. So um, in Yemen, I needed to meet a very important person who really changed, not changed my life, but has a really great impact on me. And that's uh, my mother, Amal Basha. And she's not just my mother. She's the mother of all uh, human rights activists in Yemen. I could say that. She's so brave. She was uh, doing uh, really <laughs> Uh, campaigns like gender and uh, the word gender in, at that time in Yemen in 2005 was considered like a, a devil worshiper things or whatever and they would call us all, all, all sort of stuff. So because I was into this mood of helping and uh, dispelling the darkness and enlightening the, the minds, I felt like I really needed to help. So I used to attend their meetings in, uh, back in Yemen and their conferences, Human Rights. And I just found out how great a speaker she is. She can really be, uh, she have this strong presence and she have this ability to convince people. And she wasn't the only one. She has a battalion of activists who really believes in human rights, in democracy, fighting very hard. And this is in Yemen. And even if the government gave them that space, but if there is something dangerous, it, was, it would come from uh, the, uh, the, the people themselves. Because if we want to talk about violence against women, we can't uh, like go into the tribes and start talking about that because that means uh, we, we will be beheaded or something else. So I remember that I wanted to help so much. So I, I, and I wasn't like the greatest speaker or the greatest writer about human rights. But I realized that they don't use PowerPoint a presentation, something very simple. So I remember the day I asked my mom to give me her speech and I, I just put it into PowerPoint and I added some pictures and played with the transitions and all of that. And when I brought a, mon a, a, projector, a projector, rented it and I was screening it on the wall and I can remember until today her eyes glowing with what was going on and then I spent the next three hours telling me bring that slide up, take that slide down <laughs> and she really got it very well. What happened after that? My phone didn't stop ringing for the next three months that I was in Yemen. Everybody wanted a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so yes, I did volunteer a lot with everybody. At one, po at one point, there was like five women in the room. Everybody wants a presentation at the same time because they all go to, uh, to do it tomorrow. So I'm glad that I, I did start something like this, even if it was simple. But it really gave a, a boost to the, uh, to the human rights activist. I moved after that to India. and. Um, I wrote two pages about my life in India, and I'm going to just skip that now like this. It's enough to tell you that uh, when I went back from India, during, in, on my graduation day, I was introduced as uh, the ambassador of animation to Yemen. That's what my, uh, uh, my dean introduced me to the people, the ambassador of animation to Yemen. So that ambassador of animation to Yemen, that plan went terribly wrong, and it didn't, never happened. So um, yeah. <laughs> I went back to Yemen. Um, I really started working on projects that I was dreaming on, on animation. But the fact was that I really needed to get a job as soon as possible. 
And um, I, the, the standard of work in Yemen for animation wasn't, uh, or the companies that I've been visiting and trying to explain to them the efforts required to make an animation film, it seems to be hard for them to grasp how long it could take. So I would normally get an offer and they want the job to be done tomorrow or day after. And I'm like, oh God, I can't do that. You know, if I'm gonna make a minute, that's really good quality, it might take me a year. But the idea was that I would, could organize files of works and send it back to India so it can be done. But that never happened. So I went back to volunteering with human rights. At the same time, I was doing very small uh, kind of advertisement uh, work um, uh, during that time. So I can keep going because I couldn't just keep taking pocket money from my parents. Anyway, until the time when Witness International uh, came to Yemen. And Witness International, if you have heard of it, is an, uh, uh, an international organization, an NGO, non-governmental, uh, based in New York. And um, they have a very long story. I could speak about them for hours. But they came and uh, they were helping uh, Yemeni NGOs to create advocacy films. And that's when I thought, like, kind of converted my religion. You know, I was an animation filmmaker and something very proud of. The moment I held the camera, it was like, wow, I can do all of this with the camera and I don't need to spend all that time preparing for animations. So I went with all what I have uh, with, with, with them. I volunteered with Witness. Uh, they really liked my work. Uh, I was already like a, a filmmaker. I know editing, I know uh, uh, directing. Uh, animation wasn't just uh, draw and sketch and 3D and all of that. It was acting. It was all, all the full package in India, and I, was, and I really had great mentors. So during my volunteering with Witness, and that was during 2008 and 2009, I was able to kind of produce these four films, and I'm gonna show just one of them, uh, Yemen Equal or Selective Justice, in a second. But I wanna talk about Breaking the Silence, uh, because that was like the biggest film that I worked on at that moment, and the longest even, and it won me an award. It won an award, uh, Woman Voices Now in Los Angeles. And um, the reason I'm not talking about it, because it had so much, people kind of knew about it a lot. But during the time when I was working on it, um, we almost done with uh, filming. We, are, we were done with uh, taking like the B-rolls. And I was just waiting to the weather to become better so I can get like a nice shot of the sun or get a better shot of the clouds, stuff like that. So I would have the camera with me the whole time. Until a friend called me and told me, Ammar, there's a press conference. Do you want to come over? Do you want to go? Do you want to see? I was like, yeah, let's go. And then we can go and have lunch. And, um, and they, the unexpected happened. I will, screen, I will show you the film in just like three minutes, and then I'll talk about it uh, more. This is where it all began. <laughs> all right, what's that? Can't see. Yeah, here it is.
Okay. Of course, the killer was acquitted from the uh, murder because they said he was crazy. Now, when, when we work with NGOs and do advocacy films, we artists are kind of like, um, we, have, we, have, we are not like the NGO, the people who work with NGOs. They, they kind of receive every day these dozens of sad stories, violations, and they kind of create walls around their hearts and they can like, keep going and to the next, to the next, until they can fix it. For us artists, things become a little bit personal. And this one I saw it, and especially when I saw the family the first time, it was the first time I, I meet Yemenite Jews. And for me, it was a shock because the first thing I said it was, Wow, they look like us. I don't know, for some reasons, I thought that they look something else different. But the first thing I said, that they look like us. And then I hear journalists saying that they're going to go the next day to Raida, the village where the murder happened. So I told them, OK, let's go with my car. Next day, we went to the village of Raida. Uh, we, took, uh, we made more interviews at the house, at the neighborhood. We talked to many people. We visited uh, other uh, Jewish homes. Um, there was a wedding, but there was no music, no sound, because they were mourning uh, the death of Masha. And uh, we were also under so many warnings. Don't try to make, to make problems. Don't try to antagonize anybody. Just be quick. Just do your job and go. Don't wait for anybody. So quickly, I take, my, I take the camera, and I go out the village trying to capture as many B-rolls as I can this fast. And I'm, imagine this is where I'm sitting my camera, and, and I'm like this. And this sweet, handsome Jew, who's like maybe 12 years old, so handsome, and he keeps like circling around me, you know? And every time he comes close to the camera, he make a jump. And I'm like, I, I, couldn't, I didn't notice him maybe the first three times, but the fourth time I was like, okay, okay, do you want me to interview you? Let's interview I was happy, like, and he was happy, smiling, and I'm like, okay, where are you from? And he's like, this is my house, that's my school, this is where I play, this is my friends, blah, blah. And I'm like happy with the interview, and I think that it's so sweet, and he's smiling and happy. And, and until two Muslim kids came from behind me, I didn't see them at first. And then suddenly they tell him, oh, no, 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 he, he's not, he's not uh, like us. He's, uh, he's a Jew. Uh, he's from Israel. This is not his country. And I was able to see the face of that kid uh, suddenly turned red. That smile disappeared. His eyes turned, went down. He turned around and, and kind of walked with this like kind of a broken uh, person, and I felt so hurt. It really hurted me, and I wanted to beat the kids. So I was kind of <laughs> angry. Yeah, but I was at the same time worried not to start a big problem. So as soon as they uh, start told shame on you, how could you say this? You shouldn't say that. They are Yemenis just like us and all of these things. They look at me and they're like, oh, you look like a Jew. Are you a Jew? So I was like, yeah, well, maybe I am a Jew. So I just left. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't include any of those shots from Raida in, in this clip you just saw, because I needed to uh, upload this clip as soon as possible, 
because the, 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 the court case was just going on at that time. And uh, because it's advocacy also, uh, those shots, or uh, what Hollywood people would call a million dollar shot, uh, doesn't answer or the question which uh, was um, uh, a question which I wanted to do in this film, which is like help the family uh, and do something. But the idea of, uh, of um, digging deeper into this issue and to this matter remained with me. And I kept digging into this. I kept asking about the Yemenite Jews. I kept trying to find out more about what's going on. And fortunately, there is, no, there is no books in history that tells you exactly what was going on. It, it's just if you meet like elderly people and talk to them. And um, most of them agree that we, we, we lived in peace. Uh, we were really good neighbors. Uh, Muslim, kids, Muslim women will leave their kids at Jewish houses. Jewish women will leave their kids at Muslim houses if they have to go somewhere. So I, I kept like, you know, wondering what's going on, what went wrong. I kept digging and I kept digging until I realized that there are so many things, it won't help uh, to, to do it in a documentary because um, there, is, there was already so much hate and if I did a documentary about that, I might just recycle hate, recycle the hate. So um, I realized that only through fiction that I can end that hate. And I decided that I'm gonna do something about it and I had an original idea for a fiction film. Uh, where I wanted to show uh, a Yemenite Jew living in Aden under the British colony, uh, fighting with the rebels, the British, the English, the invaders, because he's a Yemeni after all. It's not about a religion or anything. And that idea got, was like in, in my mind, but at the same time, at that time or that period, we were working in this film, with this film, um, uh, we finished uh, breaking the silence and um, you guys can search it online. I'm not going to screen it now. You can search it online and find it on YouTube. And um, it really caused me a big problem to a limit where the national security called me and said, like, this is your last warning. Uh, a lot of things happen. I don't want to go into details why they told me that. But if you want to ask, you can ask later. I'll be happy to answer. So that was my last uh, warning. And at the same time, I thought, like, I want to get into fiction. I, I don't want to do documentaries anymore. So um, a month after that, uh, with my mind is full of doing a fiction film and these ideas of uh, uh, the God, Godfather-like movie where my protagonist is like, a, a, like racing cars and he steals the British ambassador's car and he takes uh, and he gets ambushed by the rebels but then they decide to um, uh, take the car from him, but he told them like, okay, I, I want the, 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 the machine, the, the, the engine of the car, because he wants to use some parts of it for his racing car and all that. He fall in love with a Muslim girl, uh, they get arrested, and then his father, who's a Jew with locks, comes to take him out of jail, and the rebels, are you a Jew? So there's lots of twists I was working on, but I had a real problem, um, like um, when I was, trying to have him talk or express himself or why he's doing what he's doing. I had a problem. I couldn't um, find a strong ground for him so he can like say what, he, what I wanted him to say. At the same time, uh, the Red Sea Institute for Cinematic Arts, and this is the best thing happened to me in my life, actually. It made me, it made me the person who you see me right now, actually, in front of you. Um, uh, cultural attaché in the uh, uh, U.S. Embassy called me and asked me if I'm interested in joining this uh, institute. And I was like, oh, okay. They said, okay, just apply, and if, you, uh, and if they accept you, we'll pay for your uh, fees and all that. So I applied. There was a really tough exams. You have to write something 1,000 words. You have to write something no more than 500 words. You have to do this. You have to do that. Explain a character. Do this and that. And I won a golden ticket. The, the reply was, OK, thank you so much. You have won a golden ticket. So I contacted the uh, cultural attache at the uh, American embassy. And I told him, thank you. You don't have to pay me anything. They already covered it up. And at the same year, The Handsome Jew came out, this novel. It's in Arabic, it's written al Yahud al-Hali, and I can translate it as the current Jew, or the sweet Jew, or the handsome Jew. I will fight about the name later, not now, because it's too early to fight for the name. But this is the sixth edition of the book, actually. And it has such a wonderful story that I kept going back to it every time I want to uh, enrich my character in my original idea. I would be stealing ideas from there. So to, the, to a point where I was telling myself, 
why, I'm doing, why I don't just uh, uh, start with this as a first film, and then I have a second film, and then the idea got developed for a third film uh, after 1948 when the Yemenite Jews had to go to Israel, Gangs of New York, you can think of it. So why, why, why don't I start with this? Why, why I don't make it? And uh, I'm not about to, uh, to pitch, to, to do uh, a pitch today, but I will give a little bit um, about how I see the film or how I saw it at that time. So, uh, have you seen these films, Life is Beautiful, Agora? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> I, I brought, now there is lots of different sh differences between the two ideas, like Life is, uh, The Handsome Jew is not, is not a Holocaust story, it's more of an Exodus story. Uh, the Handsome Jew is not a chaos film like Agora, it's more of a, um, Sar? What is Gail? Sar? Narrow in Hebrew? In Hebrew, there is a word that means narrow. It was narrow where you cannot expand, where you cannot uh, find a better life or, or become better. So um, the reason I brought these two films to you guys because my main protagonists are the two, uh, the two characters played by, by Rachel and uh, Roberto Bernini. This is how I picture my two characters in the film, Salem and Fatima. I want them to be kind of similar to these guys. Now, I will be running some... Uh, uh, slides, pictures, while I talk a little bit about the plot. So the story of the handsome Jew, it's about this writer. He's already at uh, an old age, and he writes two books within the novel. He takes us back to his childhood when he was a kid, and he tells us how he lived in a Jewish neighborhood, how he used to bring wood to this Muslim house, and how uh, um, he met Fatima, who's older than him by five years, and at one day he visited them in their uh, holy Eid, and she was crying because they sacrificed the sheep, and, she was, and, and the sheep was like uh, her pet. So, um, because he has a dog also, so um, he, and he sculpted like this uh, with, with the, from the wood, he sculpted like a dog shape. So he saw her sad, he gifted her this dog as a, as a toy dog, and she liked him, and, and Fatima is a bookworm. She is really educated, she reads so much, and she told him, oh, Jew, do, do they teach you how to read and write? And he was, he doesn't even know what's read and write. And even when he went back to his father, uh, Yusuf, at home, to tell him about it, he was, um, uh, his father doesn't even read and write, and he was like, uh, I hear this thing, the Psalms in the Torah and all of this, they are, they are written and, and people can read them and all of that. So he starts to go to Fatima's house to, to study Arabic uh, reading and writing. And that caused an unrest in the Jewish neighborhood because suddenly everybody thought that the Muslims want the Jews to become Muslims. So everybody rushed to the rabbi house with his kids and they want them to, 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 be, te to, to be taught um, Hebrew. Salim, Salim then ended up uh, going to this class in the morning learning Arabic and going at night uh, or the evening to the rabbi house to learn Hebrew. So... Um, uh, three years passed. Salim now is, is kind of old. He cannot stay with Fatima any longer. The, the, he's a grown-up man. And in our culture and tradition, a grown-up man cannot uh, spend time with women alone. Uh, whenever they will meet, uh, there will be her father or her mother watching over them until the point where, when his dad told him, you have to come and work with me uh, in making these kamariyas because that's what uh, Salim's father is. He's a kamariya maker. And uh, Salem's also learned from his dad the craft and become very uh, good at it. And the story keeps going and developing until some, one day he receives a letter from Fatima. And then he, they keep extending, extend, exchanging letters and, and, and it develops into a love. And then they, there is, of course, there's dozens of side stories that I don't have time to cover. But... Um, I, was, I wanted just to focus in this talk about the, the, the love uh, aspects of the story. Um, so, uh, as you can see, this is just some pictures of, uh, you could call it Jewish art, Yemeni art, but for me, uh, most of these people who worked in these things are, are like Jews, Yemenite Jews, because they were the craftsmen at that time. So, um, now, uh, today, I know you were promised a reading for the screenplay, but <laughs> the screenplay is 139 pages. And that means we're going to stay here for over two hours and a half. And I don't want to do that. So we came up with an idea, and I'm very thankful to Emma and Joe, who we're going to, who are going to join us now in a bit, um, to, uh, to, to do like a teaser, as you can say. Just one scene I chose from the middle of the screenplay when Fatima and Salem uh, escaped their village, Raida. 
and they are on the way now to Sana. Uh, Emma and Joe, if you want to talk about it for a bit, please. Okay. I'll take a seat. Mike. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I don't know what they're going to do, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he hasn't seen it yet. Um, so, for context, spring flowers are scattered on the way through some rugged rocky hills. Fatima is riding the donkey, which will be the white brick, and uh, Salem is walking by her side. When you came with the donkey earlier, I hesitate to ride it until you insisted. If, I wouldn't have ridden it if I really didn't want to ride it since I was 10 years old. <laughs> but my mother told me, shame. <laughs> Women don't do that. Only men ride donkeys and horses. <laughs> we Jews are also not allowed to ride horses and donkeys, provided that we do not pass by a Muslim who is sitting. The seller of this donkey did not deliver to me last night until after he repeated this condition many times. I didn't know there was such a condition. And that's an even bigger reason why I want you to write it. You're my husband now. As you want. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to upset my bride first day. It feels like a dream. Who would believe that we are walking together? Who would believe that, that my wife is a Muslim? <laughs> Who would believe that life is a passing dream? Even if I didn't think so. Five years ago, I thought that whoever has no dream should commit suicide. I, I don't see it that way anymore. It is enough for one to live even if his dreams dry up. Life itself is a dream, and what dreamers dream about is to keep it at this level. I agree with you that life is a dream. But to stop seeking your dreams means survival. The same dream, the same life. So life turns from a dream into a nightmare. I wonder when I'm going to hear you sing. I was going to sing when I was walking. That's not allowed. How are you going to sing to me while you strain yourself by walking and I hear you comfortably as a passenger? What do you want to hear? Whatever you like. Psalms, praises, soliloquies. Have you heard of Haim? I'll sing you one of his songs. Die, die, and new, die, die, and new, die, die, and new, die, and new, die, and new. <laughs> Why did you stop singing? <laughs> I've rested enough. It's your turn now. I won't sing anymore unless you ride the donkey. I'm having fun. How about we sit down for a little? Let it, let's let the donkey rest for a little bit as well. That's a very good idea. Do you know the name of that village? I don't know. God's land? One of God's lands. If someone listened to you and believed what you said, and his sons passed on his name, and God's land will, with time, turn into a holy land like Jerusalem. Actually, it may be more important. Jerusalem is a city of the prophets, as for this one, it will be the land of God himself who sent these. <laughs> your sidelocks add to your beauty. <laughs> Do you know what I said to my mother and dad when I wanted you to stay with me? I... <laughs> I told them that I would teach you Arabic in order to attract you to the religion of Islam. They did not agree easily. But I mentioned to them the hadith of how the messenger of God had the urge, the Islamization of the children of the Jews. Did you want me to convert? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. Is it your pretty face or the hadith or maybe both? Did your parents know that you were going to run away? Run away? <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I was supposed to be the voiceover 
We can just skip over it. Necessary. Okay, good. <laughs> My question seems disturbing and annoying to Fatima. I do not know how it got out of my mouth so quickly and without thinking. Fatima doesn't run away. She told me before that she don't feel guilty about anything she do. She did not add a word until I talked to her about our arrival to Sana. Tomorrow we will arrive at my uncle's house in Sana. He has a large house. I will tell them that I married you from Jable and that you are a Jew, and your name is Shema. <laughs> Tell them the truth. You married me and took me from Raida. No one will ask you about my religion. As long as I'm with you, they assume that I'm like you. And it is true. I'm part of you as much as you are part of me. Call me Fatima. It sounds like my Arabic name, Fatima. Fatima in Arabic is the one who is weaned. Fatima in Hebrew is a source of giving. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. If I make this film, I'm definitely casting you. <laughs> Okay, and now comes to the part which I delayed because uh, the plan changed. I was supposed to talk about documentaries first, revolution, war crimes, and I was afraid that we, I won't end up, uh, we won't end up like uh, having this similar uh, attitude. <laughs> I, I was afraid to bring the PT, all the PTSD back, so I'm glad we got, we got this done. So I'm really happy. Thank you so much, guys. So. <clears throat> This is the part where I start talking about the revolution and uh, talking about my work as the voice of the voiceless. So um, when the revolution started, there was a need for an independent voice. And, um, and I don't need to tell you how uh, crazy is our world today and how important to have an independent voice. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna spare myself uh, trying to create some nice words about that because we all know how important to have independent voices these days. So um, I created a channel on YouTube and I started a series called Days in the Heart of the Revolution. And the idea was is that I go into change squares in 2011 and um, uh, spend time with, with people in the squares. And I wrote something before about this <coughs> and I must just read it for you. Um, the films presented here uh, Days in the Heart of the Revolution provide snapshots of the Yemeni uprising in 2011. As a filmmaker, I wanted to show Yemenis who have taken to the streets, the ordinary citizens who fought for change against overwhelming odds, while Al Jazeera and other international media outlets focused on the uh, calculated remarks of politicians and political analysis, analysis, I sought to capture the voices of the revolutionaries, the hope, anger, frustration, and resolve that are the true power behind the Yemeni uprising. At the same time, these films endeavor to document not just people's physical and emotional struggles in, uh, and, uh, and the violence of the regime, but the internal contradictions of the revolution that have materialized at a crucial juncture in the past years. So I have like over two, uh, two hours and 14 minutes of uh, short documentaries. And these are like my babies, um, so it was really hard to choose one. Uh, uh, but I decided to show you the least uh, watched film on my channel. And I think also it was the most, uh, the one which I made most impact with. Uh, this film, it's the last film I did in the series of Days of the Heart of the Revolution. Of the revolution. Uh, as I told you, uh, uh, the idea was to go into the squares. I made two films in Sana'a, in, in the change squares of Sana'a, but then decided to move to different cities to see uh, how they are faring, how they are doing. Um, 
it, it, it wasn't all, there wasn't always a square in different cities. There were like so many different surprises. Every film have, have a story, have, have its own hazards. Uh, in one film I was kidnapped, in another I was arrested. Uh, uh, in, in another my life was under threat. Uh, so there are so many stories that happened, but I would rather have uh, this film, which I'm going to show you right now. It's about the fisherman in Hodeida. My idea was I'm going to go to this Hodeida, which is on the, uh, on the Red Sea. Uh, and uh, I was uh, hoping that I will find a square there and I will be talking to the people. But when I went there, the story was something else. And uh, I'll let the film uh, speak for itself. All right, where are you? Can't see the mouse. Uh, yep. It's also a short film. It's not for an NGO. This is a film which I made from my own, uh, with my own efforts. Come on, turn off. Go ahead, I'll do it. All right. Got it. I'll turn it off.
don't start with that. That is not just a step of that and that's an important thing. Now, I'm going to tell you how to do this. You know, so I'm not going to do this. 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 أقول يا رب يا كريم للناس أشعر كريم خرموا للمنزل وشلوا ما أليه وما بداخله وشلوا الأوراء أقر ملكية الأرض المذكورة والآن خلص شلوا المرأة كاملة وطرحوا فيها الحجارة والجميع الأفشي الآن موجودين من في الساحة عندنا في البلاد ومن مشات أي طريق إلا هم يرجعونا أين تذهب في أشتراء حتى لا تشتراء من المنبه رسا ولا ذا إلا هم يرجعونا ما أملك تحكي وإذا جيت على أي دباب ولا ذا أهل أحب خل الدباب هنا هو روح مدريف يذهبون لك يسلبون لك ما يمنع وشلون القارب أخي كمص ما يبحث القارب أخي أخي متوفى وهل حتى الآن اشتغل على مطور إياه اليوم خمسمائة ألف وشكر اشتغل على أخواني لأن أهل بيع أسرة ما يقارب تسعة أنبوز في البيت في البيت وما هو العشرة أنا من الله فوضها من الله الشيخ لازم أنا إراء المواطنين لكن زاغت المواطنين بأس من بأس أيام ما كان الإمام ما كان شكيلي يوم ما كان الإمام ما كان شكيلي طاقة الناس لا أسألها أن نطل يعني زي من الإمام ونعشد الأمم المتحدة والجمال بن عمر ومن كان يومه الأمر وولاة الأمور أن ينظر إلينا ولا مطرة واحدة ورجل رحب وغنى لنا لا مجيب لدينا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله How much time we still have? Done. <laughs> anyway, this was the last film I made for the revolution. After that, the war started, and things in Yemen got really ugly. ugly. Um, I don't think I have another time for another film, but I really would like to talk how I did end up here in, um, in Wake Forest. Hang on. Where is it? Yes. So, in case you would like to watch the other films, you just type this in Google and you'll be on my channel. You can see the rest of the films. Um, be strong, because some of them are even harder than this. Um, so when the war started, I was alone in my house. My family was away. They couldn't get back because the, there was a blockade at the airport. And uh, since I was home alone and Many of my foreign friends has also to escape the country, so I ended up uh, looking after uh, cats and dogs. And um, my house became a kind of a shelter, if you, if you can say. So, um, and I and I really liked this. Uh, they became they became my family during the war for over two years when I was on my own. And. The, the, the thing is that it wasn't my, my films that just making me, do, I wasn't just doing films, I was also like um, doing tweets in English and uh, talking about corruption, mad at the Saudis, mad at the US, mad at everybody, mad at the Houthi himself. And they arrested two of my friends and um, I was really mad at them and I was really like talking all, uh, all the things about them, uh, trying to release my friends. So uh, with many warnings, the first friend who got arrested, uh, I got a warning. The second friend who got arrested, uh, they shot my dogs uh, in front of the house. So they meant to scare me, but that didn't really scare me. It just um, broke me. It, it really broke me. And um, I was angry for three days. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I knew the guy who, uh, who ordered the shooting of my, my dogs. I, I, I really was plotting how I'm going to kill him. It was really hard for me. But then at the second 
of I don't know what happened. I, I suddenly started this forgiveness spree. I, I started forgiving everybody. I forgave him. I forgave the Saudi. I forgave the Houthis. I forgave America. I forgave everybody. And I just couldn't stay anymore in Yemen. That was it for me. So I had to leave. I left everything. I left my cameras. I left my hard disks. I left everything. All my 20 years of work is back there hidden in some dungeons. And uh, it was like a very hard two, uh, two years also when I went to Egypt uh, with the COVID and uh, um, Trump. Uh, the Artist Protection Fund was kind of the, um, like the, um, the light that came at the end of the tunnel. And they really helped me uh, not just save my life, but also with you, my friend, uh, I was able to come here to Wake Forest. And um, I was in a, in a, in a period of healing, uh, a period of meditation, but at the same time, uh, I revived the, the handsome Jew project because uh, if, you do, if, you, if I, what I didn't tell you earlier that with the revolution and all of the, uh, I had to pause that project and slept, that project slept for now almost 10 years. And, I'm, and I don't think I would have been able to get to, to a first draft without the energy and the power of this place, without your help, guys. So thank you so much for, for, for everything you have done to me. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being so, for your encouragements. You know, in Yemen, nobody, no one have ever encouraged me for being a filmmaker or, or for being an artist, at least. It's always like, ah, uh, the camera guy, the, 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 I don't know. The, <laughs> Uh, do you make at least money out of these things? Are you going to do something out of your life? Because films, you make a film or two in a year, but you end up at the rest, rest of the year, you're just working in advertisements and stuff like this. So I, I really don't know how to end this, but um, thank you so much for being here tonight, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.